The following recording is a program of the World War I Historical Association. This special ongoing series commemorates the centennial of the First World War. This is Dana Lombardi. On September 20th, 2014, the Florida and Gulf Coast chapter of the World War I Historical Association held a seminar with the co-sponsorship of the Public Library of Foley, Alabama. Six noted scholars gave presentations under the theme 1914 Europe Goes to War. These presentations are presented here in six videos recorded at the event. Happy to honor uh, to talk a little bit about the World War I Historical Association. Um, we do have a number of different membership levels. For example, we have a $25 uh, student and military um, uh, membership. Uh, for $25, if you have an EDU or an MIL uh, email address, you can get an ele electronic copies of our publications in electrical engineering at, um, from Syracuse University and he is probably the world's expert on, on General George Squire. Is it Squire? Squire. Squire, right. thank you. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll let you read his bio yourself rather than me reading it to you. So, Larry, okay. if you would, please. Thank you. Thank you. Well, General Doty uh, uh, told you about a, uh, a French engineer who uh, became a very important figure in World War I. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm recording this. Yeah, you're recording this, but you're not in it. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's no help. Uh, who became a, a very important figure in the French Army in World War I. And I'm going to be telling you about an uh, American general who probably none of you have ever heard of, but who is uh, equally important in an entirely different way. He was an engineer like me, and he, he made some very significant contributions. Um, that is not a misprint. He did found Muzak, and I'll explain to you how that happened uh, as I go into the talk. Uh, <clears throat> how did I get interested in, in General Squire? Uh, I wrote an earlier book with, a, with an Englishman uh, in which uh, we pointed out that the British Army had access to modern communications technology in the First World War and did not use it. Uh, when Marconi invented uh, or became built his company, he used what is called spark technology, which essentially you put a spark into an antenna, a very significant electric spark into an antenna, and it radiates energy. And uh, if you do it right, you can send Morse code that way. And the uh, Marconi company dominated radio with this spark technology from roughly 1890 to about 1920. There's a major problem with it, it interferes. So you can't have two spark transmitters together. And that fact was, uh, was known for a long time until the vacuum tube was invented because before that, there was no way to put a, a what's called a continuous wave transmitter together. A uh, continuous wave transmitter is what you all know is modern radio. And as you know, you get various stations on the dial. Well, that's you tuning to different frequencies that provide information. And they can simultaneously provide that information because they're on these different frequencies, which are called carrier frequencies. With a spark transmitter, you couldn't do that. Not only that, you couldn't do voice. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, during the First World War, spark transmission was the primary means of communication. And uh, it did not do a very good job. In fact, all communication methods during the First World War did not do a very good job. 
And one of the reasons for the high casualties is the poor coordination between forces and the like uh, was poor communication between various elements of the armies. Uh, the way out, of course, was continuous wave, what we know as modern radio communications. But it was not, it was not used. Now, I knew something as a, as a double E, electrical engineer. I knew something about the history of modern radio. And basically, all the inventions that led to modern radio happened before the First World War. So I asked the question, how come? If, if it was available, why wasn't it used? And we wrote a book about it, at least in the British Army. Uh, it's a sad story, but I'm not going to reprise that. What I do want to say, however, is that the American Army, when the Americans got involved in the First World War, did give their forces modern communications, modern continuous wave communications. And the reason for that, more than any other, is this guy, George Owen Squire. <clears throat> he was the head of the Signal Corps, U.S. Army Signal Corps. No longer exists. It was during the McNamara reforms, it was abolished and replaced by something else. But the U.S. Army Signal Corps has been around almost as long as there has been an army. It began in the Civil War, used the balloons and <coughs> telegraph wires for communications, and uh, was a very prominent and important part of the Army uh, for 100 years. He led the Signal Corps during the First World War. Now, if you look at, his, at, at the awards he got, you'll notice the first two had nothing to do with his position as a Major General in the United States Army. The Franklin Institute awards uh, recognize his scientific accomplishments. And uh, you don't become a member of the National Academy of Sciences without having a significant scientific pedigree. And that's what he was, in addition to being a major general. He also had the KCMG, which is a Knight Commander of St. Michael and St. George, very high um, decoration awarded by the, Queen, the King of England. He also was a commander of the Cross for Italy. In other words, he was recognized abroad for his accomplishments as head of the U.S. Signal Corps. He also got the Distinguished Service Medal from the United States. So, <clears throat> who was he? Where did he come from? Uh, so I got interested in this because he, he had such an influence on uh, communications in World War I, but what I found out about him was that was only a small part of his tremendous accomplishments. And he is not a person who had many advantages. He grew up in a small town in Michigan, Dryden, Michigan, which is north of Detroit. It's a true Horatio Alger story. If some of us remember what Horatio Alger stories were. But this is his mother, uh, who died when he was seven years old. And this is George, uh, George Owen Squire, in 1865, the year he was born. <clears throat> kind of came from very plain stock. <coughs> the Squires originally came from Connecticut, and they moved to Canada for a while, and then the U.S. government in the 1840s and 50s said that people could, if they colonized the, the unknown territory of Michigan at the time, they could get 40 acres. So one of the Squire's ancestors moved to Michigan, and that's where the, the bulk of the Squire family exists even today. Uh, George Squire's grandfather was a fellow named Ethan Squire, who's this rather forbidding-looking figure. He was a, a farmer, and he had three brothers, but he was probably the smartest of the three brothers. And, uh, he had, uh, with his brothers, founded a town, actually, in Michigan. Not the same town that Squire was born in, but founded a town. Uh, he had one son, Almond. And Almond, unfortunately, although he was a very bright young man, went to work for a local merchant. And the local merchant was a very successful guy, but he was an alcoholic. And uh, he had a bunch of alcoholic friends, and when Alan went to work for him, uh, he too became an alcoholic and it ruined his life. Alan is George Squire's father. 
And he, he actually lived quite a while. He lived until roughly 1900. But because Alan was such a, uh, uh, unable to you know, provide for his family, uh, George was really raised by his grandfather, Ethan. So that Ethan was a very important uh, figure in George's life. Now, Ethan, from his mindset, saw that George, too, like his son, had mathematics ability. So he felt that George should become a store clerk, which is what you did if you could add and subtract. Um, George had other ideas, as we will see. But in fact, when he put his other ideas into, into uh, practice, uh, he had quite a fight with his grandfather, who said, why are you giving up this great position as a clerk and is actually <laughs> the same store that his, his father had worked in? Why are you giving up such a great position? All you got to do is keep your nose to the grindstone, and sooner or later, you'll run the business. He was probably right, but George had other ideas. Uh, when he was a, uh, a boy, uh, he had one sister, Mary, and uh, these are two pretty forlorn looking kids uh, in the 1870s. And later on, both of them grew up to be, you know, very, very handsome individuals. Uh, and uh, uh, he was very close to Mary. George never married in his life, but he, he was very close to his sister and to his sister's family. This is what Dryden, Michigan looked like. 1900, 1890, a little bit uh, uh, later than, than when George was born, but you can see it was, it's a farming community. The road still wasn't paved in 1890. Um, most of its uh, revenue came from, from uh, servicing the logging industry, which is a big deal in Michigan at that time. And uh, they, also, they also were farmers, and uh, that's how most of the people around there lived. As I say, it's 60 miles from Detroit. Now, George wanted to become a man of letters. How he ever got that, probably from his reading, he read pretty extensively. And he had a, a teacher in the school that he admired tremendously, who was a very well-educated man. And apparently made quite an impression on George, because it was his first view of the outside world, so to speak. And I think that's probably where the, the phrase came from. But he specifically referred to wanting to go to West Point to become a man of letters, to become an educated man. And it was his only way of doing it. He didn't have any money. Uh, so he was a very smart guy. And he, fortunately, uh, I believe it was the local congressman, had a competitive exam. And he placed first in the competitive exam. And he was appointed to the US Military Academy. Now, during the latter part of the 19th century, the U.S. Military Academy uh, wasn't what you would call a great fund of learning. It wasn't Johns Hopkins, or it wasn't Harvard, and it wasn't Cornell. But it did have some very good teachers. One of them was a fellow named Peter Mitchie, who's probably one of the most famous faculty members of the Military Academy uh, ever. And he, was a, he taught physics, uh, among other things. And George studied wave motion physics. Now, what that means is the, uh, the mathematics of wave propagation, whether it's waves in the ocean. And they were just beginning to understand that there were such a thing as electromagnetic waves uh, that Maxwell had uh, predicted in 1867 and Hertz had validated in, in 1878. So <clears throat> he was at a time when there was a big uh, good deal of intellectual interest in, in understanding the phenomenon of wave motion. Unfortunately, he studied under a guy named Peter Mitchie, who, who did understand it. And, uh, and George stayed with that for pretty much his whole life. He uh, graduated seventh in the class, uh, which is pretty respectable. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> in those days, the higher, I guess it's still true, Bob, isn't it? The higher up in the class you are, the, you, the more choices of uh, profession you have. And, and the, uh, the choice he made was to be an artillery officer, because it was more mathematical than, the, than the, some of the, like being an infantry officer. Anyway, he decided to become an artillery officer, and he uh, deliberately got assigned to Fort McHenry in Baltimore, which is an active military post at that time. Why? Because he wanted to study at Johns Hopkins. And I'll say a little bit more about that. 
But as a military officer, he had to do military officer duties, and he was almost killed in 1890 when a uh, Rodman, uh, which is a uh, rifled artillery piece, four, four and a quarter inch artillery piece, exploded in ancient. It was a Civil War piece that, that, uh, that almost killed him. But he survived that. <clears throat> the guy next to him was killed, but he survived it. He wasn't even wounded. And then he, uh, he did work with the National Guard, the West Point, uh, at, at those times. They would send folks out to, to help the National Guard. And he got a good reputation. But the main reason George went to uh, uh, Baltimore was to uh, sign up to study electrical engineering at Johns Hopkins University. No one knows to this day why he did that. Electrical engineering was not the profession it is today. There are very few electrical engineers. There are almost no people with PhDs in electrical engineering. In very few places you could even get one, but Hopkins was one of them. And he did have an interest and he had good mathematical training from the point. So he certainly uh, had the qualifications to study to be an electrical engineer, but why, as a serving army officer, he would elect to carry on the arduous duty of not only studying uh, for a degree, a, a PhD, but also carry out his duties, no one really knows, but he did it. He did it by essentially doing nothing else. Uh, <clears throat> he would uh, trade off with his fellow officers when, when they had something they wanted to do, he'd, he'd do it for them, and, would give him time then to study uh, and, and go to classes at Hopkins. But he, he, as I said, juggled military assignments and academic requirements to, to get this uh, done. And he wrote a dissertation, as you always have to do with the doctor, on uh, <coughs> electrochemical effects due to magnetization, which uh, which actually has a has an application uh, with razor blades because uh, they magnetize razor the old time razor blades are magnetized because it made them work better. But he was the first serving army officer to earn a doctorate, and I think he was one of only a few, um, less than ten uh, electrical engineers in the country with a PhD. So this is a pretty unusual fellow. He's also, of course, a serving military officer. He is a very intellectual person. He uh, is a, a very highly well <coughs> thought of uh, journal, called the Artillery Journal, and he was one of the one of the founders of that with, with some of his fellow intellectual artillery guys. And as a double E, he, he suggested to the Army they establish an electrical engineering laboratory, which they did at Fort Monroe. Um, all of that work eventually uh, uh, went, to, uh, went, went to New Jersey, uh, but he was right there at the beginning of the establishment of that, and he's doing this as when he's a captain. And he did, um, uh, did a lot of research on artillery problems, and as I say, they, they figured out that the magnet, to magnetize a gun barrel was a good idea because it helped, the, uh, helped improve the accuracy of the gun. Hmm. And uh, uh, that was a pretty significant accomplishment as well. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> at this point, he uh, decided that the artillery really wasn't for him. After all, he was an electrical engineer and the Signal Corps um, is, you know, needs people with engineering training and background. So he applied for a position with the uh, Signal Corps, the branch of the Army Signal Corps. And the, the chief of the Signal Corps, the CSO, Chief Signal Officer, was a fellow named Adolphus Greeley. And Greeley himself was quite a character. He actually uh, uh, was an explorer. Uh, he, he helped the Army set up the, uh, the Weather Service, which is originally an Army, uh, Army activity before it went elsewhere in the government. But he was a fairly intellectual fellow himself, really, and so he recognized Squire's ability and you know, really worked hard to get him into the Signal Corps. Now about this time, the United States got involved in the Spanish-American War. 
and it was <coughs> clear that the United States was going to gain control of the Philippines. And by this time, it was well recognized that communications were very important. So uh, General Greeley uh, felt that he had to lay cables, uh, submarine cables, in the Philippines so the islands could communicate with each other. They couldn't communicate with the United States because there was no trans-Pacific cable at the time, but at least they could communicate with each other, and it was a purely military requirement so that a uh, fairly small garrison could, uh, could stay in one island in the Philippines and manage the other uh, outlying garrisons and be able to communicate with them. But to do that, they needed to lay cable, and uh, George Squire was the guy they picked, essentially, to lay the cables in the Philippines. His uh, immediate predecessor had, uh, they had gotten a ship called the USS Hooker after fighting Joe Hooker of the Civil War uh, to lay cables. And uh, as uh, the Hooker was exiting Manila Bay at Manna Ground and sank, uh, so they, uh, they had to mount another expedition and they picked uh, George Squire to do that. And, uh, on a ship named after yet another Civil War General, General Burnside. So he's on board the General Burnside here, uh, and they're laying cable, and they connected all of the islands with a whole bunch of cables, and 1,300 miles of cables. It was a fairly substantial engineering job and a management job as well. And Squire, Squire accomplished it. It was a very, uh, very significant uh, <clears throat> job. Here he is in the Philippines. He's second from the right in the second row uh, at, a, at a military uh, camp in the Philippines. Uh, after he did that, he came back to the uh, United States. And when he was at Hopkins, he met a fellow named Albert Crehor. And Albert Crehor uh, got a PhD roughly at the same time he did. And the two of them got along very, very well. Um, and Crehor was a pretty imaginative fellow. And he had come up with a technique for a very, very fast camera. In other words, a camera with a massless shutter uh, using uh, some properties of the polarization of light. And, uh, the reason you had to have a very fast camera if you're going to do ballistic studies is that the, the shutter's got to move faster than the shell when you're trying to measure the velocity of the shell. So uh, they developed this particular camera, <clears throat> and I won't go into the details of how it worked, but this was not duplicated for another 50 years until Harold Edgerton and MIT developed uh, very high-speed cameras for use in nuclear uh, event uh, recording. Um, but they, they invented this, this device, which they called the polarizing photochronograph. Um, and it, it, it found out, among other things, that when a gun is fired, the velocity of the shell actually increases as it leaves the barrel and then slows down. The reason for that is that the shell, as it travels through the barrel, its friction holds it back. So as, when it comes out of the gun, it immediately accelerates. And, and, that's important because if you're going to try to figure out what propellants work best, you've got to have a really precise instrument to measure that because nozzle velocity is very important in evaluating the performance of a firearm of any kind. And he also collaborated with Krehor uh, to use this uh, for submarine telegraphy. Um, and they came up with an extremely ingenious way of, of speeding up submarine telegraphs, and they, they founded a company to do this. <clears throat> so he, by this time, George had roughly 10 parent patents, give or take, to his name. Again, serving Army officer, but those days you could, you could actually you know, patent stuff, uh, even though you were uh, in the employ of the, of the military. Uh, that's changed, but not quite as much, and he had quite a bit to do with that. Anyway, the company did founder. Uh, because Squire got a little ambitious and he uh, was, was approached by a cable company and they said, gee, that's a swell thing. How much do you want for it? And he said, a million dollars. 
this is in 1905. <laughs> uh, that was a third chunk of change in 1905. And uh, long and short of it is the, co the company didn't bite. Uh, <clears throat> incidentally, he and Crehor had a bit of a falling out because of that, because he was, Crehor felt that Squire's getting paid by the army, he doesn't need the income, but I need the income. And so he and Squire kind of split off, and, and, and Crehor uh, uh, went off and do, did other things that, uh, that eventually turned into him into a scientific laughing stock. But uh, that's another story. But he was very successful when he and Squire were together. They were very, very successful in, in, in coming up with ideas. And, and Squire, his, his business sense wasn't the greatest. And I think he, he, over, he overstepped himself. But he could afford it and Crehor couldn't. Uh, the Signal Corps also had the responsibility for aviation. In those days, it was felt that uh, the, the main source of Army aviation was, was lighter than aircraft balloons, in other words. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's what they used you know, for, during the Civil War and, and later on to observe enemy activity. And they had to have some way of telling the guys on the ground with a telegraph wire what was, what was going on. But the Signal Corps had the responsibility for aviation. And he became the assistant commandant of the Army Signal School at Leavenworth in 19, it was founded in 1906. And he taught there, and probably you've all heard of Billy Mitchell, uh, uh, taught there as well. Uh, Mitchell was a, uh, was a Signal Corps officer too. But at this time, George became very, very interested in military, military aviation. A persistent theme in his career is technology. Now you expect that he would be interested in technology because he, after all, he had a PhD in electrical engineering. But he he uh, was always interested in something that was new, something that was uh, you know one of, one of the wonders of the age. In this case, the the real hot button was aviation and, and uh, the Wright brothers and things like that. So he became very interested in aviation, and uh, he felt the army should have it as a weapon of war. So he ended up working with the Wright brothers. And I have a couple pictures of, of, of uh, him with uh, uh, Wilbur. But uh, he's the second passenger to go aloft uh, with uh, Orville Wright in 1908. And there's a plaque at uh, Fort Myer, Virginia that indicates that he was, he was with the Wright brothers uh, and went up with them. He had, uh, he was the assistant, uh, he was the chief of the aeronautical division, so he had a lot to do with the procurement of the first Army aircraft. And in fact, he lar was, largely wrote the specification for that aircraft. Of course, what it, aviation was really most useful for, or likely to be useful for, was observation. You get up and see what the, the enemy is doing, and since you're not in a balloon, you're less vulnerable, and also you can go to different places. So he, they, they saw aviation as a, as a good, uh, uh, as, a, as an excellent military tool, which by the way is what every, every nation in, in, uh, that had developed aviation thought about it. Um, so he was uh, very active in aviation. He continued that activity, and I'll tell you a little more about that. But he continued in that activity throughout his career. Uh, in 1908, the Wright brothers put together an aircraft, and they took it to Fort Myer uh, for evaluation, uh, the standard military evaluation of a potential new system that would be useful to the military. And this is a picture of what it was at Fort Myer. Of course, Fort Myer doesn't look like that anymore. I guess the officers club in the back, or whatever that is, is one of the buildings. <laughs> I think that may still be there, but it, 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 it doesn't. But anyway, this is the Wright brothers at, at, uh, at Fort Myer, and this is their aircraft. And here's a picture of Wilbur. Wilbur, is, he's got his leg up on the, on the frame there, and he's, he's got a stopwatch in his hand. He's the guy in the straw hat. Uh, and they're timing a, uh, a flight. 
Um, endurance was important, and you know, you, you, when we talk the endurance, we're maybe talking, if you were lucky, an hour uh, at that time. But he was time, Wilbur's timing the flight, and this is George Squire on the extreme left, uh, observing the trial, this was one of the official observers. <clears throat> and the trial was immensely successful, there were a number of flights, but on one of them, uh, Orwell took aloft a fellow, uh, a young army lieutenant, Lieutenant Selfridge, and uh, uh, Orwell lost control of the aircraft, and the plane crashed killed Selfridge and uh, severely in injured Orville. And that was a pretty big setback. This is a brand new thing and somebody dies. And uh, of course there's a public uproar and, and it, it really set back the, the cause of Army aviation for some time. Um, I might say parenthetically that I, uh, the, the book I wrote about Squire, I wrote with a, uh, with a retired Air Force officer who uh, had gone to uh, Northwestern to study history of technology. And, uh, and it was a revelation to him that his, his thesis advisor uh, asked him to, to look into Squire. It was a revelation to him how much the Army was involved in aviation, how much the Army was responsible for aviation because the official Air Force histories give very, very little credit to the, to the work that the Army was done. And, and he, was, he was shocked to find out that the Army was so heavily involved and that the Air Force somehow decided that they wouldn't make much of an issue of it. I don't know if it hurt Paul's career or not. He's a pretty vocal guy, it probably did. But, but the Army was really the, one of the movers and shakers in the early development of the aviation business, uh, not only military but commercial. <clears throat> okay, so he did that. <laughs> That's not all, as they say in the TV ad. Um, he decided to go back to the communications research because it was a pretty exciting time uh, in, the, in the communications business. They had discovered a number of, of principles, one of them being that you could put signals on two different carrier frequencies and use the same wire to uh, transmit them. But <clears throat> nobody had ever proved it. And one of the reasons they couldn't prove it was they needed a device that essentially would generate high frequency uh, electrical signals. And the only device available in the early part before the invention of the vacuum company, in the early part of the 20th century was something called an alternator, which is basically a generator like you have in your car but it was run at a very high frequency, like 10,000 cycles per second. But they could use it as a carrier for communications. And, and Squire got a hold of one, and it cost a lot of money. And he probably, good thing he was with the Army, because he persuaded the Army to buy it. So he got the, he got the Alexanderson uh, alternator, and he went to DC, and the Bureau of Standards at one end, and an Army lab at the other end, and they actually carried two separate telephone conversations on the same wire. Now, today that doesn't seem like much, but this was the first time it was ever done. And, uh, and he took out the patent on it. <coughs> uh, whether or not you know it, uh, I'll tell you anyway, but it is the invention that made AT&T possible because if you ever see pictures of, say, what New York City looked like in the 1890s or 1880s with thousands of wires on telephone poles, that meant every wire had only one conversation on it. But if you have carrier multiplexing, you can put many, many conversations on a single wire. And George Squire held the patent for that particular invention that, that led to the great expansion of commercial telephone service. At the time, he gave it uh, it's stipulated in the patent that it was for, for the free use of all, which AT&T made, made some sig significant uh, advantages uh, of it and made their company. Without it, they wouldn't have, we wouldn't have an at and And that, that gave them a little problems later in life. But, but if you look at the guy that makes the, that, who made the commercial telephone system possible, it was George Squire. Um, and that's not all.
He's obviously a comer, and he, uh, his, his intellectual abilities are well known. Uh, General Leonard Wood, the Army Chief of Staff, wanted a guy who would understand the complexities of modern warfare to represent the United States as military attaché in London. And so he picked Squire. Now, normally an attaché in a, in a foreign capital, especially a good one like London, is reserved for people with a certain degree of uh, so social uh, acceptability or, uh, shall we say, uh, pedigree. So it was a real surprise that Squire was picked, but he was picked for a very good reason, because there weren't too many guys in the Army that understood what technology was doing to warfare, and he was one of them. And he was extremely successful. Here's a picture of him with an Aviation Corps uh, officer in the French Army. Um, he was introduced to Lord Kitchener, and Kitchener was so impressed with him that he let him go to the Western Front. This, we weren't at war. This was 1915. We weren't at war. He went, wanted Squire to go to the Western Front. He wanted him, his personal report on what was going on, he wanted him to keep a diary, which is unheard of in, in the military operation. <coughs> And, and, and he wanted he wanted the first-hand report, and of course he knew that the, the U.S. Army would, uh, the U.S. government would receive those reports. The British were dying to get the art, the, uh, the United States in the war, and uh, he uh, was a major factor in that decision uh, uh, to go to war because he had he had kind of you know laid the groundwork and t told the authorities what was really happening on the Western Front. They, uh, Kitchener sent him back three times, and people were beating down the door. British allies were beating down the door. Let us send an attaché. Let us send an attaché. And Kitchener said no. But Squire, he let go three times as long as he didn't tell anybody that he was going. <laughs> uh, so he he went he went uh, visited the Western Front. He was also, as a communications guy, he recognized that there was a big problem in communications on the Western Front, which which he took to heart, and, and, and the United States benefited from it. Uh, he was so well known in, in electrical engineering circles that Parliament asked him to testify, and the big scandal that the British it was going on in Britain at the time, when they felt that the Marconi Company had bribed British politicians to, to buy Marconi products. Uh, he also worked with, uh, he tried to sell his own telegraphy inventions that didn't do too well. But he did work with, with uh, <coughs> British scientists like Oliver Lodge and Wheatstone and other people like that uh, to conduct experiments on radio phenomena. So, 1916, the aviation is still part of the Signal Corps. And uh, the problem the Army was having uh, which is not unusual for any army in the First World War, is the people in charge didn't have the understanding of the new weapon system. And uh, in this case, aviation. And this, the Signal Corps officer who was in charge of the aviation program didn't really understand this newfangled thing. And uh, he had a bunch of young Turk aviators like Billy Mitchell who were real pains in the butt. And so the aviation section of the Signal Corps was in complete disarray. So it was obvious that he was the guy, Squire was the guy to come home and fix it, which he did. I mean, he, he was, he, he knew and respected the, the flyers. He'd been up himself uh, at least once, one time we know of. Uh, and he knew, he knew all of the people and he knew and, and appreciated the technology. So he's the right guy. So they put him in charge, and he did such a good job with that, they made him chief signal officer of the Army. They actually jumped him in rank. He was lieutenant colonel, and they made him a brigadier general to become chief signal officer. And he did that in 1917, and he held that position until 1924. Uh, signal Corps still had charge of aviation. <laughs> uh, this is why his office looked like that. They were the largest single appropriation in the history of the United States Congress up to that point 
was the money they put into buying aircraft for the, the U.S. Army. Um, Squire was an ardent believer in, in aviation. Uh, he jumped over uh, his superior officers and uh, uh, made a, a, a personal uh, appeal to Newton Baker, who was the Secretary of War at the time, to uh, pay or get aircraft for the, for the United States Army. And, uh, and the, the government responded by uh, <clears throat> $450 million appropriation, which is you know, chump change in today's world, but that was a lot of money. It's the largest single appropriation to that day to buy aircraft. <clears throat> the aviation program in uh, the American aviation program in the First World War was a, a case of too little, too late. Uh, one um, um, extraordinary invention, the family of Liberty engines were, were part of that program. But in terms of American built aircraft flying over the Western Front, it really never happened. And there's a very good reason for that. Uh, the only people who had experience in mass production in the United States were the automobile companies. And when, uh, when Squire, who had the responsibility for administering this program, uh, looked around, he went to Glenn Curtis and he said, how many planes can you give me? And Curtis says, well, maybe 10 a month and so on. So they were, they were kind of custom built aircraft. The automobile companies, on the other hand, stood up and said, we can do it. <clears throat> well, they couldn't. The problem is that uh, building an airplane is different from building a car. If you run out of gas in a car, you pull over <laughs> to the side of the road. It doesn't happen with an aircraft. Uh, <coughs> The tolerances involved, the testing involved, uh, were, were beyond the industry at, at the time. They could crank them out, but they wouldn't work. Um, so other than the engine, which, which was quite a spectacular achievement, the Liberty engine, it wasn't just one engine, it was a whole family of engines. They were a success, but there was no aircraft really to put them in. Only toward the very end of the war could they actually bring in American aircraft overseas. But most, as folks in this audience know, most American aviators flew in French or British machines. Um, and the guy that took the blame for all this was Squire. He was the guy in charge, after all. And he made some stupid statements like, uh, we'll take out the Keel Canal or we'll, uh, we'll, we'll destroy uh, Crook in Essen. He should have known better, but he made these statements to the press, and the, and the press printed them, and of course, when things went sour, he was the guy that took the blame. So that was a real stain on his reputation, and I'd like to say through no fault of his own, but it was his own fault, partially, at least. He shouldn't have shot his mouth off. Because he didn't, he didn't understand mass production and the need to, and what, what was necessary in order to mass produce aircraft. <clears throat> but he did understand radio. And he had kept up through the Franklin Institute, the National Academy of Science, he kept up with all development in electrical engineering having to do with communications. And he knew that, that spark radio was no good for communications. He knew that continuous wave radio was the answer, and he knew that the vacuum tube was was the key to that. So what he thought and eventually carried out was that if I put a radio in an aircraft and the aircraft are organizing squadrons and the squadron commander can tell the squadron what to do, then no more knight errant as an aviator, nobody you know, flying over the lines without any central control, we can actually achieve concentration of force, which is, in a military guy will tell you, is very important. And so what his concept was, we'll build a radio that can fit in an aircraft, and then we can control uh, large quantities of aircraft. And that's essentially what he did. Uh, and he, not only did he have the technical understanding, he was the boss. He, he had access to all of the engineers in the country. People were begging him, you know, what can I do for the war? What can I do for the war? 
So he had some of the best engineers in the world coming to him and, and asking for direction. And, uh, and he understood the technology himself. So, and, and he could go to Congress and say, look, we need such and such and such and such and get it. Um, and he accomplished it. And it was the basis for the entire communication suite developed for the uh, United States Army during the war. Because if you can build a radio that's light enough, uh, powered well enough um, to, uh, to be used on an aircraft, you can certainly use it on the ground. And uh, so they developed the, the radio telephone for aircraft. Remember I said that you could only use Morse code before because of spark radios. You could actually voice command uh, aircraft. You could communicate with the ground. The guy in the artillery battery could call up and say, look, uh, gee, I think, I think there's a battery at such and such a place, such and such a coordinate, and they could direct the aircraft to go there. They couldn't do that before. Um, so the development of this particular radio was, was crucial to the entire communications uh, suite developed by the Army during the war. And uh, this is this is achievement. The the key was was the radio that, that I show you that the SCR 68. You can see the thing with the propeller. That's actually a generator. You put it in the airstream. It develops the power to power the radio. You can see one of these in, in the Smithsonian. You had to have a microphone because these guys are no open cockpits. So you had to have a microphone that was sensitive enough to work under that in that particular noisy environment. You had to have an intercom system so the pilot and the observer could talk back and forth. He developed that too. It was a you know absolutely stunning technical achievement. Nobody else in the world, none of the British, the French, the Germans, the Russians, none of them did this. Here's is President Wilson talking to an aircraft. Um, I guess he's the guy in the black suit. It's, it's the picture's a little hard to see, but. But there's an aircraft up above, and this is a fairly famous picture in radio circles of Wilson talking to the pilot. One of the people that uh, Squire uh, got to work for him was probably the most famous electrical engineer of the 20th century, E.H. Uh, uh, Armstrong, Howard, he went by. He uh, had the fundamental path for the oscillator, the modulator, and the regenerative amplifier. These are the, these are the key elements of modern radio. Uh, we wouldn't have radio, we wouldn't have television, we wouldn't have had any of this if he hadn't invented it, and he had the patents for it. He invented what's called a superheterodyne receiver. I won't go into the details of it, but it is the basis for all television circuitry. Um, it still is, because it's implemented with solid state devices rather than vacuum tubes, but it's still, the idea is still the same. He also invented frequency modulation, <laughs> FM system. Um, he's a very famous guy, and he, and he sought Squire out to work, and Squire knew who he was, of course, and said, you go to Paris, you run this laboratory we have, I want you to check out our new radios, and I want you to be our liaison with the British and the French. And he did. And so there he is. And uh, uh, <clears throat> that's the kind of guy that, you know, Squire would attract. And he had the chief engineer of AT&T, the chief engineer of General Electric, you name it. He had a more performance. Uh, here's Squire in 1924 with a few people you may have heard of. Mm. You probably haven't heard of Jenkins, but he was a television pioneer. But David Sarnoff, of course, was a head of RCA and uh, Brigadier General in the Second World War, Squire, and of course uh, Herbert Hoover uh, became president uh, later. He moved in pretty exotic circles. And I thought I'd put these two pictures together because it shows that for a, a guy from a small town in Michigan, relative poverty, here he is on the left with his sister, here he is on the right with his sister and her husband, who was a town doctor, going in to see the president. 1924. He came a long way, very, very long way, and a very remarkable person. This is his formal portrait, <clears throat> uh, 1932. He, he died in 1934, he got pneumonia. Uh, 
Oh, Muzak. How like how could I leave that out? Uh, Muzak, in its original concept, Squire had it that it would it would be a, a rival to radio. <clears throat> he held a fundamental patent on getting radio, getting uh, frequency division multiplex, the telephone system. But you can put music on a on a wire. And his idea was you can put it on the power lines. And power lines carry 60 cycle power, but they could also carry any other frequency you want. So he said, if we put music on the power lines, then we can deliver music in a city. You know, there's re some reason why you can't, but I won't go into that. And so he said, well, let's, let's see if we can make a business out of it. So he did. Unfortunately, radios got cheap, so he, he didn't make any money on that. But somebody discovered that if you play music in a factory, it made people work better. <laughs> and then somebody else discovered that if you, <clears throat> if you put it in an elevator, when elevators <laughs> first came out, people were scared to get in an elevator. People would, would, would be a lot more relaxed. So that's what music, Muzak came about. And he invented that, that term because it was Muzak like Kodak. Kodak is a made up name. Muzak is a, is, is, was his name for his company. So he started Muzak, and he, when he sold it, uh, which he did in the 30s, he, he became a very wealthy man, uh, and he deserved it. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is about, that's about George Squire, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, here's a book that Paul Clark and I wrote, and it's available on Amazon. Got time for a few questions? You mentioned something about the, the radios having not been used that much, and then we're going to explain that a little more. Oh, well. During, during <coughs> World War One, why, why did they do that War communication one, more? What they, they had what they called it wireless because they didn't use mm -hmm. wires. Uh, it's not wireless as we know it today. <clears throat> but what they had was spark radios, and they transmitted Morse code. You could, what you did basically was put a spark into an antenna and if you, depending on how long the spark lasted and how it was done, you could send Morse code. That's what they used on the Western Front. And the British, the French, they, everybody used, used the spark radio. The problem with the spark transmitter is interference. I maybe went over that a little too quickly. But they're illegal. The reason they're illegal is interference. Uh, in night, in, Without getting too technical, if if I had a spark transmitter on the on the desk here and another one next to it, and I tried to transmit Morse code simultaneously, you wouldn't be able to understand it because they interfere with each other. They they, they the signals are too broad uh, from a frequency standpoint. They, as opposed to putting something on on a 500. Uh, AM and 600 AM and 700 AM, they can all be transmitted simultaneously. You can't do that with Spark. So they used radios, but they had basically one radio per division. That's it. Which 12,000 men, 24,000 in case of Americans, to c control that many men with one radio, a little hard. Mm -hmm. So it was, it, was not, it was not very, very effective. So it was limited use because of potential interference. of interference and maybe getting the wrong signal. Well, you couldn't, you couldn't, you, you couldn't, couldn't use it at all, or you just. Um, you, oh, you, yeah, yeah. If there wasn't another one, if there yeah. wasn't another, you know, transmitter. But don't forget, the enemy is radiating too, mm -hmm. and he, he could jam it without even trying to jam it. Well, all that's what I'm saying. You get the wrong signal. Yeah, you know, yeah If it, another one is jamming, you it's unusable. It was basically unusable. Yeah. Okay. They tried, but it was unusable. A question on, uh, you said that he was the first uh, one as a military attaché to go in the trenches. Don't you mean he really was the first to go into the British trenches? Uh, because the American uh, military attachés for, for France, I believe, were going in uh, uh, long before that. Uh, he was the first man that Great Britain, that Lord Kitchener, yeah. in fact, he, he, for a long time, the only man. Yeah. that Kitchener would allow into the British <clears throat> area. And he could go anywhere he wanted to and talk to anybody he wanted to. Uh, his first mission over there was secret. The French had, they may have had officers, I'm just specifically speaking about the British, yeah. Yeah, well, but it would be American officers who would 
go far to the trenches and then write reports about their experiences or write reports about the technology they have uh, uh, they have seen. Exactly, right, yeah. yeah. But, and they may have been able to do it for the French, but uh, the, the British were very, very reluctant to have anybody go in except for him. Yeah. yeah. Sure. The city remained chief of signals until 24. Right. You don't hear of him in connection with Mitchell, because when Mitchell comes back after the First World War, he's working for Mason Patrick and Charles Ranner. Right. And they're all the ones that are involved in the famous <coughs> court martial, but yet aviation still belonged to Signal, didn't it? No, it didn't. No. Okay. What happened was there was such a scandal in 1918 about the American aircraft not uh, being seen on the Western Front. They took it away from the Squire, and uh, he, he, he got the blame for it, you know, and they put it under Mason Patrick, and the first squadron of planes equipped with the radio telephone were on a review by Mason Patrick, not George Squire, the main who, men who had brought it into existence. Thank you, Larry. Oh, you're welcome. Great.